this beautiful Sunday night, we are coming to you live from our Nile Serena studios. This is Perspective with Josephine Karunji. That's from wherever you are watching us from. We are coming to you live from the Kampala Serena Conference Center, Nile Room. And tonight we'll be talking about engaging men and boys in the prevention of violence against women and girls. My guests this evening, I'll start with uh, Mrs. Rita Atukwasa, who is the Executive Director, Institute for Social Transformation. Welcome, Rita. Thank you, Josephine. Right, and right across is Karo Idembe, the Program Manager, Interreligious Council of Uganda. Welcome, Karo. Thank you very much. Uh, and finally, Mr. Eric Tumwesije, Gender Officer, Gender Mainstreaming Directorate, Makere University. Also, Eric, I hear you <coughs> are now an international consultant. Would you like to tell us a bit about this international consultancy? Is it to do with uh, men, male engagement as well? Thank you very much, Josephine. It is uh, beyond male engagement. The international consultancy is on women empowerment and gender equality. Okay. So I am now going beyond working within my country to look at how we can extend our potentials to other countries in terms of addressing gender inequalities, but also specifically addressing the question of gender-based violence. Okay. Is yeah. the, the problem sorted in our country? <laughs> no, 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 it's uh, not sorted. We are, doing, we are doing a lot. <laughs> okay. But there are those who are quite lagging behind. All right. All right, let's say it as it is. talked about this, we've had this conversation a number of times, uh, gender-based violence, and you know, women and girls always come out as, as the, the victims, mostly, you know. So before we get into male engagement and involvement, I wanted to know how we are faring in the fight against gender-based violence on its own. Do we have, have we improved, are we doing better, do we have any statistics that are new, Eric? Yeah, I think as a country we are doing a great job in addressing gender-based violence. And specifically in 2001, 2002, when we had our Uganda Demographic and Health Survey uh, on wife beating, we had 77% of women justifying wife beating and 64% uh, of men justifying giving reasons why you should beat your wife at some point as you were disciplining them. But if you look at the, the UDHS we just had in 2016, the statistics have fallen quite, quite, quite marginally. You said 77? 77, 77 in 2001, and 2002. Now? And now we have 49% of women supporting wife beating as a wife disciplining, and 41% uh, of men supporting the same. Why so do we are. still have <coughs> these numbers even? They are actually even higher. That is now national figures. Yes. But if you move beyond the national figures, <coughs> you go into unpacking the box to see what is inside. For instance, in the western region, it is still at 73%. So the, the acceptance of violence and white beating as well is still high. And it is embedded within the social cultural norms of the country. Okay. Yeah. Rita? Yeah, I could say, let me just give you a tip. Last, yesterday I was doing my haircut in the salon and uh, you know as a social scientist I always take effort to listen into people's conversations and make sense out of them so the guy who was working on my hair was having an argument with a colleague about relationships and then he said to him no in Uganda you put out fire with fire ah. that if fire, fire burns one side you go the other side you set up fire then when they meet in the middle then the fire <laughs> will stop <laughs> specifically referring to a relationship they were discussing his colleague trying to tell him he's having trouble that is the best advice he was saying and that was specifically violence so it tells you that however much efforts have been put to really prevent to end violence people's perceptions are still very very strong but i would want also to say uh, you mentioned about male engagement to remember something good that happened to africa and the whole world uh, last week the Nobel, the 2018 Nobel Peace yes. Prize winner, Dr. Dennis Mukwenge. I think we all need to mm. celebrate. Yes, we do. And yes. in this perspective, he is a male. Mm. So I think it speaks for itself. It that the men should 
take up the seat and be able to join the fight against uh, gender-based violence. I, I thought I'd mention him later in the show, but then I thought also Eric could bring him up, but well, I think uh, <laughs> we're glad that you, you brought him but up. Josephine, I want also to say that um, those statistics uh, also vary from region to region. In the Busoga uh, sub-region, it has reduced. In 2006, Uganda Demographic Survey report, uh, the perceptions on violence were at 74 percent. But right now, we have 48 percent. So there are areas where it has changed because of the interventions and mitigations that are going on. So it varies in Uganda. OK. Mm -hmm. Well, then let's look at other interventions that have not. I'm, I'm, I don't know if, if male engagement has been a core of the interventions, but I think that's what we should focus on today to see mm -hmm. how much m more we can do it in regard to that. So what does society tell us about men? Um, what expectations do we place on them as mm -hmm. they're growing up that then could be a cause for gender-based violence among women and girls? And we're all looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> what do they you know, tell you? <laughs> I, was, I was looking at my travel bag this morning. And uh, looking at it, there was a lot of stuff in the bag. And I put this stuff in that bag, selectively, choosing what to put and what to leave out. Okay. And I was thinking about how men and women have been nurtured, have been developed, have been taught. Society has a Bible that we cannot find physically and pick somewhere and read it. But it is written and everyone has seen it, even without physically seeing it with their eyes. So they have told us a man is the decision maker. A man is the breadwinner. A man is the head of the family. A man is the leader. So the question of violence against women by men, most cases, a man will lead, even when they are going to lead you to the ditch, they still have to lead you because they have been told that they are actually the leaders. Yeah. So there is a lot of inscription, there is a lot of engraving on us that has been told to us by the society. Okay. D do we have sons, Karo, Rita? Yes, we do. What, what are we telling them? <laughs> <laughs> of course, like you know, uh, yeah. the change starts with me. Mm. You cannot give what you do not have. So if you're a champion of change, you start by leading by example. So when I look around at men in my life, uh, whether they are boys or you know, brothers, you, you always try to reach out to tell them you could do better. This is what society sets the standard, but this is what human being deserves to be doing, the Ubuntu kind of, of thing. For instance, for me actually, with men I quickly want to usually pick the uh, issue about emotion. This uh, whole thing of saying you're a man, you will not cry, you're a man, you don't have to show fear, you are a man, you have got to portray, you know, uh, charisma all the time, even when the times you really need to, to be vulnerable a bit and accept that I am in fear, I'm in pain, and I need help, all I need to talk down. And one of the vivid examples I usually want to refer to is when men lose their loved ones. It, for me, it touches me every other day. A man loses a spouse. And every time I am in such a circle, you mm. see this man coming mm. out to take charge of all the organizing. The soda is not there, they're asking him. Mm. The food, they're asking the him. Firewood the firewood, everything. Up. When a woman loses a spouse, she's actually, you know, seated. shielded. Mm. Of course, each mm. has its own implications. Mm. But look at this man who's lost a spouse. Mm. There is a process of believement. Mm. And really, psychology tells us simple basics that when you suppress such emotions, they could erupt on you and yeah. at a wrong time. Yeah. So that is just to give an example that you beat this child is a boy and you say, do not cry. Yeah. Yeah. What does that do inside yeah. them? So for me, I, I usually pick on those things to encourage the men to grow up and do as human beings should do, but not try to, to embrace uh, what against the science and possibly what God has made to say you are a human being you can smile you can cry you can laugh you can, you can joke, feel you can be sad you can feel yeah. which is okay yeah. I have Her. two sons uh, one is sitting is senior six um, this uh, next month but Arthur amused me he's in King's College Voodoo. he amused me in 2012 when he was in P7 me and him, we usually read newspapers. So he brought this newspaper where an African man had 12 wives. And he asked me, Mommy, how does this man 
husband manage this wife, uh, these wives. It was very interesting, and I told him it's not easy, because each of these wife is unique, has her own interests, and that's sometimes where the conflict comes. And he said, I, you and daddy, you too. But the others are many. Sometimes that's where we have a discourse with our culture, with our religion, because that's how we have been brought up, and sometimes that's where the conflict emerges. So for this young man, we had to get through and talk, have a conversation, mother, and son. And he said, me, mommy, I don't think I'll be able to manage this. To manage 12. <laughs> to manage 12. <laughs> <laughs> but he was in P7. So sometimes we, actually not sometimes, but all the time, we need to have a conversation. And we actually cook. I was cooking with him when we had that conversation. So we need to bring our boys, even our husbands, because it's very good to to even have a conversation when you're cooking, not in the sitting room when uh, Josephine is showing us other things on TV, but to, <laughs> 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 but to have a conversation about real issues. Yes. Sometimes at the, at the fireplace so where our grandparents... So the kitchen is not taboo uh, for yes, them. Not, yeah. Where have we gone wrong in trying to involve them <coughs> and engage them before? Uh, I think one of the... And I was having a chat with Kara Aria. One of the mistakes that we had from the beginning of these conversations, we looked at it as women as victims and men as a problem. And we wouldn't blame the process because the people that initiated the conversation, the women, were the ones that were feeling the problem. So they were addressing the problem that they were feeling. But then at some point, we looked at men as a distant problem that everybody must target with uh, an arrow. The, uh, the problem. The men? Yes. I think men, at uh, <coughs> that time, they were the problem. The, yes. Which I think is wrong. They are a problem, but also part of the solution. <coughs> if you want to address gender-based violence, if you want to address violence against women, the process starts and ends with men because they are the ones that are perpetrating the violence. So if you are going to stop it, you have got to speak and convert the perpetrator of the problem. But as much as you may speak to my sister, you speak to my sister about their rights and how they can face the law, how they can go to courts, how they can get to rights, when Eric still, still insists that he claims the rights to what you're claiming, then the violence is then it will increase. One of the things that culture has taught us <coughs> as men is never to lose. And this is not just us here in Uganda. In most of the communities in Africa, we have been nurtured, we have been told, you don't lose. Even when you see yourself, you're drowning in the river. You still have to win the battle. So if you don't have this man and you change his thinking towards the violence, in as much as you speak to the other side, you are not solving the problem. Is this a, a, a thought that we agree with? No. Uh, uh, no? I, a bit of, not to say no, but uh, a bit of more analysis on my side that mm. to say that it starts and ends with men. For me, I would think uh, it's like a, a partnership. Because when you say it starts and ends with men, then you are still going to focus on men and you say it is your problem, you start it, you fix it. But I think looking broadly at all the stakeholders involved to come mm -hmm. into play, yes, we talk about men and women, we talk about institutions, religious institutions, we talk about culture, so that everybody comes mm -hmm. into play. Mm -hmm. And I do not think we have gone wrong. These are society problems that there is no one, one that can fix it. It needs multiple um, uh, approaches. approaches to be mm. able to deal mm -hmm. with it. Because yes, he speaks about the culture and the household, then you talk about the church, then you talk about the school, then you're going to talk mm -hmm. about the laws. Mm. Mm. So we have not gone wrong. We are still on the path, but we can do better mm -hmm. to say, can we, especially one of the things I see for me, can we have our brothers and, and uncles and grandfathers use their voices and powers? Because most of these are seated in homes where they have lived violence-free lives. Rita, I, you're, you're going ahead of me. Yeah. So I, <laughs> <laughs> I, want us to, I want us to look for a way forward told when, me when I was we come back. Fast. Mm. Okay, well, <laughs> well, you never listened. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a short break. Okay. We'll be right back. Mm -hmm. Saloons. 
we offer professional barber, hairdressing at Lugogo Mall, Garden City, Forest Mall, Oasis Mall and Acacia Mall. Sparkle Saloon, professional, affordable and quality services. Every woman and girl has the right to live a life free of violence and discrimination. Leave no one behind. End violence against women and girls. you live from the Kampala Serena Conference Center Nile Room and tonight we are talking about engaging men and boys in the prevention of violence against women and girls. Let's take a question or comment from, from our audience. Yes? Thank you. I'm Mas Gwanasur. Just I want to, what is your take on the men who are being uh, mistreated by women because we are majorly focusing on women but even okay. men are being restricted. All right, so, so his question is, what's your take on men who are being mistreated, mistreated by, by, by women? And, and uh, so I was at a conference recently, and um, we were talking again about gender-based violence against you know, women and girls, and a man was quick to raise that question, and the woman said, see, this is one of the problems, that when we start having this conversation, <laughs> quickly somebody brings that up. But it's here. Who wants to take it on? Uh, I would say we do not condone violence whatsoever in all its forms to anyone. So the men who are equally being um, violated, we still call upon them to come up and speak out, report the cases, seek for support, and equally the law caters for both women and men. The law does not discriminate when, whether you report the services that different organizations, churches, uh, state uh, sectors do provide target both men and women. So please, the men are encouraged to speak up. Uh, and also perhaps, Eric, you, yeah. could, you could also share from, from a man's point of view how men can help men mm -hmm. who are handling situations like this. Thank you, Josephine. I watched uh, a policeman from Kawembe who was beaten by his wife and children. This guy had one leg. He's a policeman but also a disabled man. So when he was beaten, he called his colleagues at police to come and help him. That was actually featured on NTV. He, was, he called them to come and help him. And then they laughed at him. They said, how can you tell us that your wife has beaten you and will drive to come and pick you up? And this guy was saying, I would rather resign in police. You know, one of the problems that we are having for men experiencing violence is the question of silence, that we don't want to speak out. And the silence is not because men love to keep quiet. Because they have been told, you don't speak such things. A man cannot be beaten. How do you stand and say, my wife beat me last night? Upbringing, you can't show emotion. You can't yeah. feel these things. You, you just can't do that. So I think we need to talk with each other, to be real. Yeah. Because sometimes there is what we call the ideal and the reality. So we need to come out and be real. The UDHS indicates that men are also facing mm -hmm. violence. Yeah. So yeah. we mm -hmm. need to come out and speak. And one of the interventions is to go out there and speak to them to actually encourage them to report. You can report to your fellow man if you're still afraid to go and report to my sister. Or report do to do we have parenting. hotlines? Perhaps you should start a hotline for, for <laughs> men who are suffering abuse and are not comfortable talking to people and you. We do have hotlines, but I think they are still at agency levels, okay. institutions. If you go, for instance, to my university, we have hotlines. If people are facing sexual harassment, they can actually call in direct and be helped immediately. Okay. And we are also developing uh, anonymous apps. So the guys who cannot actually want to come out physically <laughs> and report, they can actually go into the apps and report cases, and then we can respond to them immediately. I want also to say that uh, for religious institutions, the conversation is on, especially mm -hmm. the... Uh, fathers union also the youth unions both in the church and in the mosques and it is healthy because sometimes if you have your very own speak out and share the experience then you can be able to find a solution so the conversations are going on and uh, it is healthy to to share because sometimes it is society that tells you men don't cry but it's good to cry, especially among men. Then you'll be able to find the solution. Okay. Well, let's take another question or comment. Well, while one of you gets the microphone, um, let's, let's also talk about what we need to do about these norms, these societal norms and, and the cultures. What, what, what can we do to help us go forward? I think the whole process of deconstructing 
or people unlearning to be able to learn new ways of doing things. And unfortunately, much of the things we do learn is by seeing and doing. We watch what others do. So this is where now you come back to the home, then you go to the school, then you go to the church, where we are appealing to people to say, in a home, make it a friendly environment for both girls and boys to be able to grow up in the sense of equality. That if they are participating in household chores, let them all be able to do. If they are using language, use language that is progressive, not language that is regressive. For instance, to start saying, you've given birth to a girl and that is Shukari. You know, mm -hmm. and you equate a girl to Sukal. What does that do? Mm -hmm. You know, for a child who understands may even question you and say, Sukali, why would you refer to mm -hmm. me as that? So we need to to learn from the good things that others are doing and we are able to copy so that we unlearn and then adopt those new uh, right. is mentorship a, a thing that, that we should give attention to? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think one of the things that we need to start doing now is to look at the young generation. Because the, the culture that we are living in starts when we drop. The moment your mother delivers you, culture starts working on you. So if we are going to change the terrain as it is now, then we need to look at the young, the, the young men, even the women. Because like I told you, the women are also supporting this, some of these uh, bad habits. Mm, they are so custodians. They are the custodians. Mm -hmm. They are the ones who are saying if you, if you burn food, they should beat you. If you deny your husband sex, they should beat you. If you go out without telling him, he should beat you. So we need to start from the young generation. It's things that are taught in schools at the young level. For us who are in the discussions of promoting gender equality and male engagement, the IEC materials, they should be produced early and disseminated down so that as these boys grow up, they actually deconstruct what they believe that yeah. they have seen all the time. I want to say that uh, culture is also not static. Mm -hmm. uh, I think three, four years ago, there was a bishop who, who passed on in Kako, but the hair, he had boys, but the hair was a girl. So there are those who have come out, and uh, in my conversation, I always say not all men are violent. Absolutely. There are those who are good, like <laughs> all, not all women. <laughs> not, sure all not, women to beg to no, not all women <laughs> are bad. But I want to say that there is, I think we are moving, we are no longer at 100%. There are those who have changed and they have promoted their, their daughters to study. And uh, probably some of us would not be on TV here, but we had a push of a man saying my daughter will study, my daughter will do this. And uh, I have my own in-law whose father kept on telling him, you're going to be a very prominent woman in this country. And he would always invite her to sit on the dining table. He says, you're going to be here. And even when she had a challenge with firewood, she said, you're not going to cook using firewood. You're going to be a very prominent woman. And I want to say right now, she is heading a department in the medical school. She's a, medical, she's a doctor. But because the father spoke to her, very positive words. So I want to say they are men and we encourage them to speak positively with the girls, but even with the boys. Yeah. Because we need to empower the boys to be able to, to move together with empowered girls. Because sometimes when we empower the girls and we disempower the boys, then there is a clash. But we need to empower both gender, and then we will be able to get it. I'm sure we are on the, on the right track as okay. Ugandans. Okay. Oh. Mm. You know, in terms of the mentoring that you talked about, we need to look for the men, like she's saying, that have converted and believe that this is actually the right direction to take. Like the you? The, the Ericis and <laughs> the friends. Okay. So these people act as champions in these discussions. Because once we have, for instance, members of parliament in Uganda coming out to say, I am a champion of preventing or totally alleviating violence against women. As opposed to coming out to say women need to be beaten when. Uh, <laughs> OK. Yeah. yeah, I totally. Let's take another question. Alagoy. Diana, do you want to be a bit louder? Diana Alagoy. Yes, what's your question? My question is, are men 
faced with a many faced with the domestic violence to the same extent as women. Mm -hmm. Are they? Well, I have seen the statistics which even show that at some point men are facing it higher than women. I would really want to know the that statistics. statistic. In the UDHS, <laughs> I just read it in the UDHS, where they are giving 52% of men experiencing spousal violence. But the thing is, they don't talk because they were saying out of the men that have experienced violence, only 30% have Report. come out to talk about it. So yes, they do, but they are not talking about it. Okay, that, that means that we can't really tell because they're not reporting these things. Exactly. Okay. Uh, but Josephine, I want to say that it's, uh, if you look at the Uganda Demographic Survey Report of 2016, if you find women in some regions are facing, they are having 35% are women, you find about 20 or 11, it's men. But we are, n we are not accepting, we shouldn't accept violence, but we are saying there are a percentage of men who are experiencing it, but we want zero tolerance to, to violence. To yeah. violence. This regarding where it's, you yeah. know, whoever is being yeah. affected. Yes, quest, quickly. Actually, mine is in reference to the community I represent. I'm the gender minister of Makere University. And the biggest change I've found with gents when it comes to the fight against sexual harassment is pride. Gents have pride. They have the ego. I mean, they don't feel comfortable to come and talk about it. Everyone feels like, how will I even come out and say, a lady, ha a lady harassed me? So the, my concern is we really need to talk to these people. They need to understand that they also have rights. They need to solve the pride and solve the, the ego to come and speak about it. Otherwise, mm. we shall just be wasting time. We shall preach to them. But unless they solve the ego, mm. they won't speak up. Okay. Male champions. Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a comment, honestly, from Barbara. Mm -hmm. I, I just came back from Liberia today. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my conversations with the legislators, I found out that 95% of the inmates in Liberia are men. I was intrigued to find out in my country what is the status. Mm -hmm. I actually found out that 95% of inmates in Uganda are men. It's not something we need to be proud mm -hmm. about. Yeah, yeah, that's it's true. something we need to question. The men need to question it. And actually, I think it is even the men that should question it. Even women. Why should we have <laughs> all this population of men in prison? Like mm. she has said, you have to swallow your pride at some point. Because these guys were in prison, at some point they just wanted to prove they are men. And they are there. You were there for 20 years, 50 years. If you are not lucky, they hang you up and you're gone. This is a good time to take another short break and we'll be right back. Is brought to you by Star Times. Enjoy digital life. We're coming to you live from the Kampala Serena Conference Center in room, and tonight we're talking about engaging men and boys in the prevention of violence against women and girls. Let's take another question from our audience. Yes. Thank you so much. much. I'm Derek Mutumba. I think, according to the, the violence in the societies, the societies from which our children or our relatives come in from or grow up from also influences a lot of things. I've stayed with a number of people, but with the way parents behave reflects a lot. Mm -hmm. Some parents keep on fighting each other, quarreling, and this now, mm -hmm. you know, as the children grow up, keep on seeing this, and they also do what? Pick That's paid or they take it up. So don't you think our societies also need to do something about that behavior? Thank you. All right. Ab absolutely, absolutely. The whole problem is from society. The whole question of gender-based violence, violence against women by men, is from the society. It is what men have watched. It is what they have seen. It is what they have heard. Some of them have been told, but I don't think there are so many conversations where a father says you should beat your wife or you should beat, but they have watched them do mm -hmm. it, so they carry it forward as a habit. Yeah. So definitely if we are to change 
violence against women as it is now, gender-based violence, we have got to go down in the society and change the values and the perceptions and the norms that we have held for a long time. Okay. Yes, another question. Thank you very much. I'm Olympia Mukara. I'm a lab technician by profession. Uh, my comment is about, there's an article I read earlier this year mm -hmm. saying that the government and some NGOs are, are fighting this gender-based violence targeting the rural areas. Yet the research also show that the middle class, there is a mm -hmm. high increase in gender-based violence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my question is, are you putting there any program mm -hmm. to help the middle class? Mm -hmm. And another thing, lastly, uh, I conquer with you, we have to involve in boys. And this should, I call upon everyone who is watching, who is part of this audience, to involve our young ones as they grow up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think the middle class. Been, you know, efforts towards the middle class where you talk about maybe, you know, people, you know, formal employment and business. For instance, you know, one of the things we were faced with some time, I think two years or three years back, was the judiciary, mm -hmm. the revelation of what was happening uh, with the, the magistrates, the state attorneys who are female, who are working <coughs> there. I think uh, uh, regulations and systems have been, uh, s the process mm -hmm. has started yeah. to make sure it is monitored. In the banks, there are organizations that are starting to seek audiences with women who work in the banks and this was in an effort to solve this puzzle it is assumed that when you go to school as a woman mm. you are empowered to be able to overcome uh, consequences that come with gender inequality but it wasn't seem to be obvious that it can be fix a problem mm. you still have women who are working but their ATMs are controlled by their husbands you have them who are working even when they say you have this trip to go and do something at Harvard she has to shake and even wonder how she's going to start engaging her husband so those efforts are there and they will continue to be there but we encourage more actors to still come Just on board to address because it's a huge problem how do we for the middle class, now that he's brought it up, how do we engage men? How do we proactively now go out and say, this is what we can do to bring more men on board? One of the things is to, for men to understand that it is okay, one common thing to disagree. You know, some people think the moment you disagree, then they, they lose it everything. It is okay to disagree. It is okay to respect people you live with, you work with, because they are human beings, they have rights, and they have level of dignity. I like that. You know, so that if it is your wife and she disagrees, the option is not violence. The option is to sit down and discuss. Look at what is her point of view, what is your point of view. And if a common understanding can be generated well and good. But not all the time must the disagreement end in a consensus. Yeah. Sometimes there is a compromise to say, okay, if you want to do this, it is for your good and you still insist, mm. go ahead, I will support you. But not to say you will not do it and then it causes conflict. Then they, yes. they, they okay, please. Okay. Yeah, just to add on something mm. small from what she's saying. The government of Uganda in 2016, passed the national gender-based violence policy. Mm. And also, in the same year, same year, I think, or 2017, we had the male engagement strategy. As part of implementation of these two documents, one of the core functions that we need to implement is awareness creation. So I think that we need to start conversations with these men. We need to start conversations. And it, it, the middle class is actually a very good entry point for us. Because when Eric comes up to speak, I don't want to blow a trumpet for myself, but when I come out to speak to my folks in my village, if I come to speak with the, uh, my students at the university, they have a lot of faith. They yeah. have a lot of confidence that they believe in me. So we need to influence these pockets of the middle class with the right information which they can now carry on to the other junior members of society. So for me, the issue is about respect for one another. Because if you really were, was created in the image of God, you're b the best for the Lord. You're the best for God. So if you see your spouse, especially when people date, they, they are their best. Are you going to keep that beauty? Are you going to keep that handsomeness? 
until death parts, if you're married, even when you're single, even when you have children. Yeah. If we had that, because you cannot, from a legal point of view, you cannot hurt your neighbor, love yourself as it is biblical, but it's also in our books of law, where you should, you love your neighbor. If you love your neighbor like you love yourself, then you shouldn't hurt the another, because yeah. definitely, we shouldn't be having people who have scars. We, and that is the mark on your body. That is the mark on an, a Ugandan. I think for me, it is a national issue where all of us as Ugandans, as we celebrate the 56, we should say no to violence. Whether it is a man, whether it is a woman, whether it is a child, whether it is a disabled person. So it is a value system that we want to come up with and say, Probably in the whole world, people will say there is one nation, the Pearl of Africa, that has peaceful people and they don't fight. We can be, work around that as Ugandans. Thank you, Carol. Let's take one more question and then in response to his question or comment, you'll wrap up. Yes. I'm John Lawrence. Yes. Uh, a student from Akere. Yeah, uh, my comment is just on uh, what uh, one of our presenters uh, said. Uh, about the male involvement. Yeah, he talked of some of the institutions and uh, the platforms or the media that yeah, we are using as in to, to engage these men. Uh -huh. Yeah, but we have outside there, we have some of the men who are ignorant. They know more about, they don't know more about what? Some of these platforms, the media, some of these yeah. institutions. They are really not aware of mm -hmm. them. Okay. So what have uh, we tried or what have uh, they mm -hmm. tried as in to make these people know more about this platform? Eric, I, th I think that's Thank for you. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, just give the microphone to the lady in front of you. I wouldn't want her to leave without saying something. Uh. Eric, as you <laughs> can respond to him. Yes, I think uh, the, the, the organizations that have been working at community levels mm -hmm. have done quite a lot on engaging men beyond using this form of information. Men, engaging men in the sports uh, activities, engaging men at community level in community interactions and discussions where you don't necessarily have to write information that they have to read, but also using posters, t-shirts with local information that people can actually read. So they cannot use the hotlines like we have in universities but they can actually have community level discussions. Okay. Maybe, Josephine, one what second. There Just is quickly, there is an approach called SASA. Yeah. SASA approach. That one deals with an individual. So when we have champions who are changed, it will, it's very easy to have a conversation with another person. So the SASA approach is a very community-oriented uh, strategy to help men uh, and women fight uh, uh, violence. violence. Yeah. Right. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm Akosa Pofia, CDFU. Now, it's, to me, I see that it's all about acceptance. Men must accept. Once you accept that my, that my wife mm -hmm. is fit for such and such a position, mm -hmm. for example, she has become uh, a member of parliament, mm -hmm. just accept and let her be there. Mm -hmm. Look at her Support as her. any other person who is fit for that position, mm -hmm. and life will continue. Thank right. you. Thank well, I'll start with you, Carol. If mm -hmm. you could just wrap up for us, what you'd like us to take home from this conversation in two lines or, or so? For me, the issue is about stopping violence starts with me. And I want to, to retaliate that uh, it is it is a vision, it is a mission that I have decided. I don't want to be violent to anybody. My name is Idembe and means peace. peace. So peace starts with me and then I can share it with other people. All right, thank, thank you, Carol. You. I'll come to you. I want Eric to close because we're talking about men involvement. Yeah. So <laughs> For me, it's to say be, be the change that you'd want to see. When people ask a question, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Then I ask, what are you doing? Because if you get this message, go out. Many of you are seated here. When you see this challenge, be bold and take a step. Give them s steps in which they can be able to have alternative ways to deal with it. So, and change starts now. Okay. Yeah. Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I have already said that uh, you can have a doctor, a PA man with a PhD, if he's a Munyankore, he's a Munyankore doctor. 
if he's a professor, he's a Munyakwari professor. If he's a permanent secretary, he's a Muchiga pro permanent <laughs> secretary. We grow up in academics and ladders, but our cultures keep moving with us. So the process of engaging men and changing men is something that is gradual. What is important is to start the efforts. Mm -hmm. yeah. And my last statement to men especially, for me, using violence is the highest way of expressing a man's inferiority and not superiority. A superior person uses their superiority to actually attract people to themselves. But once you start repelling people from you by using violence, then you know that you are actually becoming inferior, right. but not superior. Right. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you, Rita. And thank you, Carol. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us this evening as we spoke about male involvement and engagement in the fight against gender-based violence. Coming up is NTV Weekend Edition. Keep it NTV.